the Atlantic Richfield Career Development Assistant Professor of Energy Studies in the Engineering Division at MIT. She's also uh, an external professor at the San Jose Institute, um, where she has spent um, a substantial amount of time before going to MIT. She received her BS in Materials Science and Engineering from Cornell University. She was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University, where she received her PhD in Materials Science. Um, she spent time at Columbia University as an Earth Institute Fellow, where she focused on energy systems modeling. And her research evaluates the dynamic cost and environmental impact of energy technologies to inform and accelerate the development ways which uh, succeed in addressing climate change. We've had some great conversations already this morning. We look forward to more. Thanks. coming out on this rainy afternoon. Um, today I'm going to be talking about some work that we've been doing in my group on the predictive evaluation of energy storage and other technologies. And um, stand over here. Um, so the way this presentation will go is we'll start with a bit of a research overview, talk about how this uh, research fits into existing research communities and various disciplines. Um, and then I'll go through a couple of examples on evaluating energy technologies in order to speed up their development. Now, developing a technology can be a lot like looking at this control panel. The question is, what knob should I turn um, in order to get to the solution I want? And in the context of climate change mitigation, there's an urgency around this problem. How can you know we really need to um, develop technologies that are you know, low in cost? reduce emissions and so forth, and, and do so quickly. Um, and so what I'm asking is, can we use data and models to decide what control panels to, uh, what control knobs to turn, what new control knobs to create in um, developing clean energy technologies? Uh, there are three parts to this research. Uh, one is to look, we look at targets uh, for technology performance that are formulated around societal goals like climate change mitigation, um, uh, policy goals, for example. And then we look at how technologies are changing over time improving and how that rate of improvement compares to, to targets for technology performance. And then finally, we look at technology design and options kind of going under the hood of technologies to say what options are there um, in the laboratory on the manufacturing floor in order to speed up the development, to speed up the rate of progress. So taken together, this work is on the predictive evaluation of energy technologies to accelerate their development in the laboratory. And uh, laboratory here is broadly defined. It includes the manufacturing floor, the engineering laboratory, labs that some of you may work in, um, as well as the field, so the installation of these technologies. And this is a new area of research that I've been developing over the years. Um, and um, I would say that um, some of the distinguishing characteristics of the sort of novel characteristics include this aspect of the predictive evaluation. So really looking forward, saying, how do we want our technologies to improve? And then focusing on development in the laboratory, as I mentioned, looking under the hood of technologies to understand what about the technologies can we change. And so there, our decision variables aren't just how much uh, to spend on R&D and different technologies, but when we're doing R&D, when we're doing research and development, what can we uh, change uh, about our technologies to um, in increase the rate of improvement? And so one way to think about this is that I'm trying to do something similar for energy that's done in other areas like drug development, where folks are trying to combine epidemiology with pharmacology to try to you know, speed up that process of drug development. So this is the, the area of research that I've been working on over the years. And it really came from some motivation it, it, from some of my early work in the lab where I was really interested in, um, you know, I worked on developing solar cells, for example, but I was really interested in, you know, are we on the right path? And can I use data and models to figure out what path I should be on in developing these technologies? Um, and the, the research, uh, the goal of the research, sort of looking at the broader picture, is to inform technology design. Uh, we work a lot with engineers that are working in the lab um, and companies and so forth, and the private investment portfolios as well as policy design. 
in the form of R&D policy and regulation. Now, one theme that will come up throughout the talk is a focus on performance intensity metrics. And so that's things like cost per unit energy or emissions per unit energy. The reason we're focusing on this is that uh, performance intensity is, is one of the things we can improve in the lab by, for example, increasing uh, the conversion efficiency of the technology or reducing waste in manufacturing that influences performance intensity. And so we're interested in uh, trends in performance intensity or targets for performance intensity that can enable um, a given level of performance, big P, that meets societal goals. And of course, there are a lot of interesting interdependencies in this equation um, and you know, that, that we look at as well. And so some of the specific research questions are listed here, uh, where we look at cost targets for stationary storage, um, you know, try to understand cost trends for photovoltaics and other technologies, battery performance targets for electric vehicles, and then methane and carbon emissions reduction targets for energy technologies. Um, and the types of metrics, these performance intensity metrics are listed there on the right. Um, and so I consider these to be some of the most important uh, technological development challenges in transitioning to a clean energy infrastructure. So these questions have been really chosen around, you know, what I consider to be some of the really you know, important technological development challenges. And they also make for some interesting research because there are a lot of interacting parts in these complex systems that we look at. Um, and one of the things that we've you know, so these are dynamical systems changing over time, changing from one context of technology adoption to the next. Um, and one of the things that we've looked at, uh, or one of the things that we've had to do in developing this research is to build new data sets, really try to make those available to the public, wherever, you know, to other researchers wherever possible. Um, and these range from, you know, what I call large data, tens of thousands, to big data, you know, getting above 10,000 to hundreds of thousands of data points. Um, and, you know, so, so that's, you know, that's sort of in the doing of the work that um, has been a big, an important part because unlike some other areas, I wouldn't consider this to be a very data rich area. Oftentimes, as I, I'm sure a number of you know, I've spoken with a number of you, you know, you're constructing these data sets from scratch. Um, and that's, um, I think, important to do. And the situation is improving. Okay, now a number of you work in areas that are, um, you know, kind of addressing big, real-world, messy uh, kind of problems. So, so research questions that really try to address these big societal problems. And I think there are a number of research communities that are emerging that do this. I've listed three of them here that our work relates to. Um, our work fits under the broad category of environmental engineering, but we contribute to these communities that are listed here. And specifically, um, on the technology evolution side, of, you know, we re our work relates to the you know a, a, some really great work out there on the evolution of technologies with time and experience, and then on the in industrial ecology, there is an effort to look at metrics to characterize life cycle environmental impacts, and that's something that that we um, you know work with and contribute to as well. And then in energy systems, this is another uh, community, really uh, people coming from many different disciplines with many different objectives, but trying to the big question is to get at energy transitions to, one of the big questions is to get at how can we transition uh, to an energy <coughs> infrastructure that mitigates climate change. And I would say most of these papers tend to focus on big P um, and looking at scenarios for reducing emissions overall, you know, cost assessed society and so forth. Uh, one of the things that we're doing <coughs> is to try to, you know, turn this around a little bit to focus on little p, um, you know, considering targets to big p, but then saying what lessons can we bring into the lab for how we're developing our technologies. Okay, um, and then together I would say there's a growing field, a uh, growing number of us that are working on, you know, not just my group but other groups, the forward-looking evaluation of energy technologies. So saying, you know, how do we want our energy technologies to perform? What are the constraints that we need to work around? How can we get on a good technology development path? 
Um, and one of the things that I'm looking forward to doing in the next little while, year or so, hopefully, is to organize um, a workshop and engage in some other activities that will help this group of people coalesce, because I think there's a lot of interesting insights out there. Um, and it would be great to bring this group of people together um, to work, to really work together. OK, so now let me transition to talking about some specific research results. And these are um, uh, papers that are done in collaboration with my research group at MIT, pictured here, um, a number of uh, students and um, postdocs with different, uh, and, and research associates with different backgrounds, undergraduate, in some cases grad backgrounds, ranging from engineering to economics, physics, and so forth. And it's a little bit hard to see, but one of the reasons we look so happy here is that we have a roof over our heads and there's this blizzard outside. This is one of the blizzards that I think many of you maybe ex experienced this winter, maybe not to the same extent as in Boston, but you know, this was one of those days. So we all made it to take the photograph. And, you know, it's quite nice uh, and cozy in there. Okay, um, all right, so let me spend a little time focusing on a, a specific analysis um, of the cost targets for stationary storage. So that's basically energy storage that doesn't have to move around. Why is storage important for renewable energy? Uh, well, the big issue is that, of course, wind and solar um, are intermittent energy resources. So we don't control that intermittency. And uh, storage could be used, potentially, to convert these intermittent uh, sources to base load power. Um, storage can also be used um, to shift production to high demand times and also times when the electricity price is high in order to increase the value of renewables for investors. Now these are two different objectives. I'm going to focus on this one actually because I think it's one of the first opportunities for storage <coughs> in the marketplace. If we're thinking about a competitive market, investors will adopt these technologies if they'll increase the value of their investments. And so I think this is one of the first opportunities, and I think we might be, as you'll see from these results, in a little bit of a sweet spot right now for storage development, where there is added value to be had by integrating, you know, by, by adopting storage together with your wind and solar generation. And it's not clear for how long that is going to continue, so now they may be a sort of opportune time for these technologies to enter the market. And Storage may actually be very important for, as many of you may know, for continuing the um, cost decline and increasing rate of adoption of technologies like wind and solar. Um, here we see that solar, which is actually shown an unprecedented high rate of cost decline. You know, costs have really been dropping, um, but to bring costs down forward and also to make uh, these technologies usable at large scale storage is likely to be a critical uh, component. All right, now, that's great. You know, we need to, I, I've said I want to look at uh, cost targets for storage. Um, that's good, but isn't, you know, is this a, an easy or a difficult problem? Uh, well, I would say that it's a little, it's a little bit tricky um, because and one of the hurdles that, that um, you know, researchers and practic practitioners have encountered is that Storage technologies are really quite different from one, one another. We have a diverse set of available storage technologies. If we look at costs, um, you can think about storage, we can break storage costs down into the cost, the capital cost of energy and the capital cost of power. And if we look at different types of storage technologies, they differ in that you know, some provide cheaper power, um, more expensive energy, some provide um, cheaper energy and more expensive power. And there's no single technology that looks dominant if you look at these two dimensions of storage cost. And so the question then is, how do we compare different storage technologies on a common scale given these two dimensions? So that's what we're going to go through is a way to do that. And then uh, once we've done that, we can answer the questions that are shown here. How inexpensive do these technologies need to be in order to add value, and how do current devices that are out there compare to these cost targets? Okay, so 
what I'll do is I'll, we'll look in this analysis at three locations. We've looked at a number of other locations as well, but we'll look at three locations here and two energy resources, solar and wind. And we're going to take into account the real-time electricity pricing, so the spot market electricity price, how that's changing on an hourly basis, and then also the hourly availability of, of, of sun and wind uh, for generating power. And in the first step, you know, so, so this, you know, what we're going to be doing is looking at the value that storage adds to solar and wind. And so in the first step, we're going to say, okay, you know, this is a resource management problem, and so if you adopt storage at a given size, a fixed size, how do you manage the um, direct sale of electricity generation to the grid versus storing that energy? And so we have this simple schematic here, and this is you know pretty straightforward problem to solve. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to output electricity directly to the grid, or 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 store store that energy and output it later in order to maximize revenue. Given the changing electricity price, and then given the number of constraints uh, related to the max power, the size of, of the storage system in terms of the power capacity, the size of the storage system in terms of um, the generation capacity and, and the power capacity for charging, and then um, the constraints imposed by the size of the storage system in terms of the energy capacity of that system. When we do this, uh, we see that, as we would expect, here we have the electricity price is changing over time on an hourly basis. Here we're just looking at four sample days, but we look at increments, you know, we look at the entire year uh, for the optimization problem. And, um, and here we have the wind and solar uh, resource. Um, and by adopting storage, what happens is that we output the, um, uh, we generate, we uh, concentrate the electricity output into shorter bursts uh, when the price is high, as we would expect, right? So we're outputting electricity um, when the price is high. And I should say we're, you know, in this case, we're looking at the case of very of, of small levels of penetration of solar and wind, where these plants are price takers. That's something that is, um, we can talk about a bit further. So we look across the three locations that I mentioned, and then the four seasons of the year. And you can see qualitatively similar behavior across all of these locations and these seasons. Um, you know, you can start to see some differences, like in Massachusetts, you know, in summer, you know, um, or fall, you know, this is not a very sunny day in Massachusetts, and then we have, you know, California, you see these very regular um, sort of sinusoidal um, patterns of um, natural solar output. Um, but in any case, so you can start to get a sense that the importance of storage or the size of storage, the value will be different across these locations and different seasons. Um, but what storage does is it shifts the, um, the ex expected price, uh, the selling price, to a higher value. So it's shifting this distribution to the right so that your expectation price is higher. Um, and that's something that we see across all of the systems. Okay, so that's, 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 that's great, but I've left an important consideration out of this analysis so far, which is that storage isn't free. It comes at a cost, right? So a number of you may have thought of that. Um, and uh, it'd be nice if it were free, that would be great, but it's not. Um, and so we need to take costs into account, right? So now we, we've looked at how one would operate storage in order to maximize revenue, but how do we decide whether or not to adopt storage? That's going to depend on this uh, benefit to cost ratio, or the revenue divided by the cost in this case. Um, and so. We're going to use this expression now to find the optimal size of the storage system in terms of storage energy, which is just the storage power multiplied by the hours of storage, um, and also in terms of storage power. Um, for different levels of cost of generation, so different costs for your installed uh, PV or your installed wind um, plants. So we're going to re now look at this analysis and we're going to decide how much storage to adopt 
for different costs of storage and different costs of generation. And in this, in this case, we're separating out the cost of energy and the cost of power of storage. Those are two capital costs um, that we're, we're separating out. Um, um, so, you know, we can think of this as, you know, if you have a, a pumped hydro facility, for example, your storage energy costs would be those costs associated with the reservoir, and the power costs would be those associated with the power generation equipment. Now, when we do this, what we see is that, as you would expect, as the cost of storage increases in terms of the cost of energy and the cost of power, um, and here we're looking at the case of $1 watt Texas wind, um, you adopt very little storage effect in that upper right panel, there's no storage adopted at all, because adopting storage does not increase chi. And then we can come down to the lower left panel here, where you see that uh, by adopting storage at these much lower costs, you increase your chi value. So this is for a given location and a given generation cost. But I started out giving the sense that I wanted to compare technologies not just based on a specific site, but across many sites. Because that's really important if what we want to do is this predictive evaluation, this forward-looking evaluation. We need to take, we need to sort of take some of the site specificity out of it and say, are there any general conclusions that we can draw about how we should be developing storage technologies? So now let's look across a number of different locations and assume that any developer in any of these locations would optimize the size of the storage technology. So we choose the storage size that's going to maximize chi. So we're no longer going to show chi, on, uh, sorry, show the storage size of the plot. Uh, what we're going to do is collapse all of these plots into, these will all show up in the upper left uh, panel of the next plot. And then we're going to look at different generation costs and uh, different locations and look at the chi value. So here, all of those points and many other storage cost points are, sh are captured in that upper, um, upper left panel, um, where we're looking at a range of different energy, storage energy costs and a range of pa storage power costs. And, um, and then the lines are showing lines of constant chi. So these are iso chi lines. Um, and the value is shown here. And um, so as you go to the lower left-hand corner, as storage gets really cheap, chi increases. And that's the case across all of these panels. So these are lines of constant chi, and as you go, as you reduce the cost of storage, you know, you're adopting more storage, and, um, and your chi value, your, re your revenue and your cost, that ratio increases. There are a couple interesting points to note. Um, one is that if we look across different locations, so going from Texas to Massachusetts to California, you can see that um, the value of these systems changes. Right? Um, so in Massachusetts, actually, um, and I'm sorry, Princeton may be similar in this respect, um, you know, these systems aren't as valuable. Um, and, you know, in other uh, in California and Texas, they're, they're more valuable. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting is as we go from the right to the left, we see that at a given cost of storage, the value added is less. So the threshold, the cost threshold below which the storage technologies have to be, so they have to be cheaper than that threshold, that becomes more stringent as you reduce the cost of generation. So if we're now at about $2 a watt wind, uh, this is why I'm saying that this may be a sweet spot for integrating storage with these systems, because as the cost of generation decreases, storage has to be that much better in order for it to add value. And that's because as an investor, you would rather adopt more wind or more solar rather than, than paying for that storage system, because that's going to give you, give you more um, return on your investment. Now, there's one thing, I've talked about how things change across these different panels, but there's one thing that you may have noticed is, re re uh, is rather consistent across the different panels, and that is the slopes of these lines. And that's really important because that tells us 
the direction in which we need to improve storage technologies in order to uh, maximize chi, in order to increase chi by the greatest amount. Um, so, the, so these slopes are similar across the different locations, and it means that the direction of optimal improvement of your storage technology costs, trading off energy and power <coughs> cost reductions, is relatively location invariant. So it's similar across those locations. That's interesting because it starts to say, well, this, this could provide us with some guidelines for how we should improve storage technologies. And in a minute, I'll show you how certain technologies available today compare to these isochile lines. Um, the reason why that's the case is, um, and we've shown this through derivations and also empirical work, is that the distribution of the duration of price spikes across locations is relatively consistent. So the height of the price spikes, um, their frequencies differ, and that's what determines the value of storage, but the distribution of the duration is relatively consistent across the locations. Yeah. <coughs> So I just want to make sure I'm interpreting these, these plots correctly because to me it seems that if you have high wind costs, isn't that what this means on, on, on the side? Yeah. So okay. if, if it costs, if the generation of, of, of electricity is, is more expensive, what that says is that you, you would never install storage based on these plots. Is that correct? Because, yeah. because you're below yeah. this profitability threshold. And no. that just seems very yeah. strange to me because it seems like if, if, if it's expensive, then you really want to be able to store it yeah. as well. No, you're, I think your intuition is right. Uh, so the profitability threshold is where the system overall without subsidies adds value. Mm -hmm. um, but what we see is that given that, um, um, or sorry, let me say that again. So chi equals one is the profitability threshold where if you exceed it, the system is profitable without subsidies. Right. But we know that there are a number of policies in place that are leading to um, growing markets for solar and wind. And, um, and so even at values below one, um, high values below one, um, these systems are still being installed and adding storage can still increase the value. So I'm distinguishing between a profitable system um, and a system you know, where storage adds value. So even if you're below the profitability threshold, adding storage can increase the value of your system. So your intuition is right, um, but we see, and we'll see this more clearly in the next slide, is that at higher generation costs, the threshold below which your storage has to be in order to add value is actually less stringent, it's higher. So at more expensive storage costs, um, for more expensive generation, you would, you would still adopt some storage. Yeah. But then as generation costs decrease, as an investor, you're better off um, adopting more generation than additional storage. Okay. Yeah. Think level 1.7 appears on the left and only 0.7 appears on the right. And, and right. up is good. Yeah, so up is good. Up is good. So, so at any lines. at any generation cost, reducing your storage cost is going to increase chi, right? So that's that's good. You know, it's always good. But the threshold um, below which the, the storage cost threshold below which you would ins you would choose to install storage becomes more stringent as the cost of generation decreases. Yes, you push on because you've got the technology for it. Yeah. So that's shown here, and um, and so what what I'm showing here. Okay, so now I'm showing these thresholds explicitly. So what we see is that as this is for Texas wind, as the generation cost decreases, these are the thresholds below which your technologies need to be in order to add value to these systems. Um, so you can see that that threshold becomes more stringent as the cost of generation decreases. Um, a couple of other things that we see here. One is, you'll notice that these are big areas here. Right? These are based on a meta-analysis of cost estimates in the literature. Um, and you can see there's a lot of uncertainty, perhaps ambiguity, in what these storage costs actually are today. And that's an area that deserves further study. 
But another thing you'll see is that for a few storage technologies that are out there um, today, um, for, at least for some of the cost estimates, they do add value to uh, Texas wind at $2 a watt, which approximates the situation today. So storage is adding value. The system overall may not be profitable. Um, you know, and we can talk about some considerations that, that go into that analysis, but, um, but adding storage would add value. Another thing is this, I think this plot shows the benefit of this kind of analysis because it shows us that despite the fact that we have twice the, um, the power costs, so the capital cost of power for pumped hydro storage and compressor energy storage as compared to lead acid. So despite the fact that power is more than two times as expensive or roughly two times as expensive, it's based on some estimates, um, these systems are still, these hot, the pumped hydro and compressor energy storage are still more valuable. And that has to do with the slopes of these lines um, it, and is something that this kind of analysis can, can tell us about. So what we learn is that we can, you know, we can uh, kind of live with slightly higher, higher power costs, um, <coughs> but, um, you know, you know, and, and, and that despite having these higher power costs, these systems are adding more value. And they also give us, this also gives us some guidelines as to by how much we need to reduce um, energy costs. And what we see for a lot of the batteries is that um, a reduction in energy cost is, is actually, is, is very critical. And we can see here by how much we need to reduce those costs in order for these systems to add value. Um, now, um, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so, so that's, um, I think, an important consideration. And then one of the things that we're doing right now is to decompose these cost estimates in order to try to pin down uh, what the costs actually are today. And that involves working with companies. We're working with a few, um, you know, battery manufacturers and so forth. The other thing is, you know, one of the reasons we're interested in batteries in this context is that these resources, you can imagine, these technologies are going to be limited to a smaller number of locations. They're not going to be, you know, we don't have the resource available to install pumped hydro or compressor energy storage at the cost shown here in many locations. So they're much more limited, uh, which is why, you know, developing technologies like batteries you know, and then lead acid has the additional concern of, you know, regarding toxicity. So that's where some of these other battery technologies start to look really interesting. Um, and then I think there are some questions if we look at lithium ion, for example. I mean, these cost estimates are all over the place. We're trying to refine that. Um, but there are some questions as to whether the mobile storage technologies might actually start to look better because of their dual use than some of the stationary technologies, even for these for, for certain stationary applications. Okay, so what is what are to, to summarize the results here, uh, what we find is that storage can add value to wind and solar in some locations, but cost improvement is needed on both the generation side and the storage side for the system to reach profitability overall. And um, if we, we can have in our minds the target of around one dollar a watt generation and $50 um, per kilowatt, um, uh, per watt uh, storage power costs is $50 per, um, 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 sorry, $50 per kilowatt storage power costs and $50 per kilowatt hour uh, storage energy costs in order for the system overall to be profitable. Um, and, and, and where are we now? So where we're, we are now is shown here, which um, I don't know, maybe some of you have better resources, but we've scoured the literature. These, this is where we are now. So, so the this is representing where we are now, but of course we're probably not here. I mean, this should converge on a smaller number of points, a more constrained range, but that's, that's kind of the next part of this analysis. Mm -hmm. So, so the estimate is, is literally that uncertain, or are those different technologies in similar acid? You know, it's, it's, these are likely to be, repre it, it's a little bit difficult to say, frankly, because the cost estimates that are published, you know, tend to look at this aggregate scale. And, um, and so this is for an analysis of lead acid. 
And then there are a few studies that go into detail, but don't look across technologies and have different methods and so forth. So this is, this is it, let's think of this as capturing lead acid and capturing you know, the full diversity of, of technologies represented by yeah, that they're huge. I know. Huge. Yeah, so those are huge. And and you know, we've seen, I mean, lithium ion, those costs are are decreasing. We know that um, probably due to economies of scale and manufacturing. Uh, yes, did you have a question? Uh, I'm a little bit confused because when I'm looking at PHS as an example, um, on the right and on the left, the uh, cost values are significantly or appear to be different. In any case, it seems to suggest that certain battery No, it's storage. just cut off. Okay. Yeah. The certain storage modes are are look like they're preferable. I mean in your example the PHS C A E S. Right. Yeah. For this application. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. But maybe more geographically constrained, not available in all locations. C A E S would be we should be available in lots of places though. Um, it depends on whether you I mean, if you, this is for, you know, where you have, some of these lower cost estimates are for where you have a natural, you know, sort of cavern. And, yeah, it could be available in more locations. Um, okay, now, okay, so this analysis, a uh, couple points. Um, so improvement needed for widespread profitability, but these systems can add value to solar and wind in some locations now. Um, the optimal cost improvement trajectories are relatively location invariant for the locations I just presented. Um, and that's important because the results can then inform broader industry and government um, technology development strategies. Now, when we start looking at a case where you have renewables power plants becoming, that are no longer price takers, but where you have greater adoption of renewables, and we've started looking at the case of Denmark, things will change. So that may also be why now could be a sweet spot for adopting storage in the marketplace. All right, so let me now move on to a few other examples, because I want to give you a couple of other examples of this research on evaluating technologies. And one more example <coughs> relates to energy storage. Uh, but now this project is looking at mobile uh, batteries. And in this work, what we wanted to ask was, Across, if we look across the entire U.S., um, all U.S. cities, we take into account how people are driving, how far, but also their driving patterns. Are they, you know, speeding up and slowing down? What is the detailed, what are the detailed velocity histories that their trips are following? How many of these vehicles could be replaced by electric vehicles? And how many of these vehicles could be replaced by electric vehicles that are inexpensive? that are affordable by, you know, by, by many that are below average um, cost vehicles. And I'll go through this example pretty quickly, but I just wanted to point out that you know, one of the things we're doing in this model, which combines detailed information based on high resolution GPS data on how people are driving on a second to second basis with survey data that covers the entire US, so we're looking at millions of trips here, um, one of the things that we're able to do is capture some of the variation in the energy consumption per meter, energy, the fuel economy of these vehicles depending on how they're being driven. Um, so by combining data sets that are very detailed in nature, these detailed GPS data sets with, with this broad coverage uh, survey data that gives you only distance and time of trips, we're able to estimate the energy consumption. That's important because you know, if you're this guy here driving like this, you're going to be consuming a lot more energy um, per meter traveled than if you're this, this guy here following this green line. And so this is all taken into account in this analysis, and this is in work to be published uh, soon, hopefully. A couple of interesting things that we find. Um, one is that, so here I'm showing across the entire US the distribution uh, vehicle day energy requirements. Um, if everyone were to be driving a Nissan LEAF, so we chose, I'm, cho I'm choosing to represent these results based on the Nissan LEAF, because the Nissan LEAF is substantially below average um, in cost per mile traveled um, based on that 100 most sold vehicles on the market today, which we also analyzed. Um, and uh, what you see here is, is um, that 
about 90% of the vehicle days could be covered by the Nissan Leaf. So that's all the energy required for the vehicle to leave home in the morning and come back at night. About 90% of its days can be covered by the Nissan Leaf. But only about 40% of its of total transportation energy could be covered by the Nissan Leaf. Um, and that's because a lot of the energy consumption of personal vehicle transport is represented in those 10% of days um, you know, that, that are not covered by this, by this technology. So it brings, you know, it, it leads us to some interesting conclusion. One is that many people um, could potentially purchase the Nissan LEAF and it would cover the energy requirements of most of their days. But to meet climate change mitigation targets, further improvements are required um, in electric vehicle batteries. Um, so what we find is that a more that costs of batteries need to be reduced by cut by in roughly in half, um, a little bit more than that, and um, energy density and specific energy energy should be more than doubled because those things correlate with the cost of the vehicle overall. Um, another kind of interesting thing, which reminds me a little bit of the stationary storage analysis, is that there's actually some similarities across cities. So although different U.S. cities is very different. Um, these tail fractions are actually pretty consistent across all of the U.S. cities. Um, and that's because, um, you know, so basically the way to think about it is that if people are taking their car out, um, the distribution of vehicle day entry requirements is roughly the same across the cities. Um, the per capita vehicle energy consumption is different across cities because um, the the probability of car, that you own a car or uh, the probability that you choose to take your car out to get to work, for example, it differs across the cities. So I think it's an interesting example, again, of some of these locational similarities. And there's also, of course, locational differences. But it points to targets that can be set for these technologies to inform broader technology development strategies. and just to kind of give you a sense of where, you know, kind of the, how might this research be used and how are we um, sharing these results with um, industry and policymakers? Um, the results can be used to inform technology development in the lab, guide investment by private firms. We're working with some storage um, uh, companies or companies that have rec recently acquired storage startups. Um, and then also we're working with um, some policymakers at the federal level, because I think how we formulate storage technology adoption incentives is really important. Storage can do a lot of different things, and I think if storage is to be adopted such that it can be developed for the benefit of society, we need to formulate those incentives very carefully. Um, so I invite you to, you know, for example, if you're working on a storage technology in the lab, I've been going around and giving this talk, and I've gotten a lot of feedback from different students and professors that are working on storage technologies and sort of communicating with them. Um, they're thinking about, you know, I got this really great email from a Stanford student who, you know, wanted to use the results to improve, you know, think about what he's doing in the lab. Um, and that's exactly the kind of thing that we're trying to do with this work. So I encourage you to be in touch um, on that. Okay, so now let me quickly go through some other Work and this is going to be really. I'm going to go through this really quickly because I want to leave some time for discussion. Um, in some other work, I mentioned in the beginning we've been looking at emissions intensities for energy technologies, and basically the question here is you have different energy technologies and they emit more than one gas. That and these gases have different properties. So if we look at methane as compared to carbon dioxide, we have very different radiative efficiencies, very different um, atmospheric removal times or decay properties. Um, but we need to compare these, these technologies to one another in terms of their global warming contribution in order to inform, again, technology investment and development and also policy. So what we've done is to propose an alternative um, to what's currently used now, which is the global warming potential. Um, we're proposing an alternative metric to that, which takes into account your ultimate climate policy goal um, such that you can value, uh, appropriately value methane against CO2 based on that <laughs> ultimate climate policy goal. I can go into some details um, if there's interest, but the, the results when applied to the comparison of natural gas 
versus coal is that at current leakage rates, you lose about 50% uh, of the advantage over coal that you started out at um, within a few decades for natural gas. So natural gas used closer to 2040 is, not, is gonna provide about half the benefit that it provides today um, unless we reduce methane leakage. And so the other thing that this metric does is to allow us to inform quantitative methane emissions reduction timelines. And we're working with the EPA and others because, you know, to, to, um, to hopefully inform the discussions right now around methane regulations because the Clean Power Plan, which I think is, is um, you know, as it should do, it focuses primarily on carbon dioxide, but there's a need for an alternative, uh, complementary focus on methane. And, um, and what we're doing is, is say, and, and to do that, it turns out, you need some sort of equivalency metric or conversion factor. Um, and, and, we, and so we're working with um, EPA and with others to um, put some, to quantify the methane leakage that would be required to meet the US's overall greenhouse gas um, emissions reduction commitments under the Clean Power Plan um, in such a way that you're um, consistent with broader global goals to stabilize radiative forcing. So that's some work I can talk about if there's interest. Um, you know, again, working with firms and, and policymakers on this. Um, and um, there's also an interesting international discussion that's happening about possibly replacing the GWP, the global warming potential. And very quickly, in some other work um, that I've done over the years, um, this focuses on technology cost trends and looking at how, if the past can tell us anything about the future, essentially. And of course, we can never predict the future, but can we do better than a random guess? And in this work, uh, what we've done is to take a lot of data on a lot, a lot of different technologies to test different forecasting models and then to propose a forecasting model that allows us to forecast not just the expected cost, but the expected error in that forecast. Um, and this is something that I think can be used to make decisions around mitigation, around emissions reduction commitments that are robust to a lot of the inherent uncertainties in forecasting future technology costs. Um, and one of the interesting, I think, things that is a theme that's emerged in other work is that data on many technologies can improve the forecast for single technologies. Um, and then, in a more simpler sense, what, one of the things we found is that Moore's Law is not just for computers, um, and this general exponential cost decline applies across many industries. We've made this data available um, to the community to use and play around with, so feel free to do that. And then in other work, we've gone through decomposing these cost trends further. Um, I want to mention this because it relates to a discussion I had with one of you earlier, uh, where we propose that um, some technologies are more commodity-like and some are more technology-like. So commodity-like technologies are where um, a greater portion of your overall costs are contributed by a raw material, a traded commodity, that we don't expect to trend up or down. And so that's going to impose a cost floor on your cost reductions. And that can, I think, improve forecast and, and allow us to say, even in technologies where we don't have a lot of data, are these technologies likely to see you know, long-term cost reduction trends as we see in photovoltaics, for example, or would we expect this leveling off as we saw in coal-fired electricity? Um, and then in some other work, um, we've gone through and said, well, what about, can we come up with a mechanistic model for why technology costs are changing over time? And what we learned here is that with a simple model, we're actually able to support one of the theories that um, is out there, one of the simple models that is out there, the experience curve, which shows how technology costs change with um, increasing production. But we're also able to relate the rate of cost decline to design features of the technologies. We find that for technologies that have fewer component dependencies, where their components are more independent, they can improve more quickly. And I'm also doing some work on um, using this insight to go back to one of my early technologies I worked on in the lab, which is the PV systems, relating very high level concepts like economies of scale, learning by doing to very detailed components of a PV technology to say why has PV costs come down and how can we ensure, you know, how ensure we can't ensure anything, but how can we 
you know, make design choices and manufacturing choices to continue that cost decline. There's some general principles that come out of this work, um, which I think I've covered, so I think we'll, we'll kind of go through. I want to leave time for questions. I think a very, I just want to put this up here because I think it's, this was coverage of some of one of my papers, and I think it, it, it I think it's a useful message um, to sort of end with. Um, if we step back and we think about the discussions that are happening right now around climate change, mitigation, and international discussions, countries are submitting their IMDCs, for those of you that know about it, committing to different levels of emission reduction. And I think it's important to really understand that we're in this, this really interesting time right now where things are really speeding up in clean energy. We have these nonlinear improvement trends, and things could really change in the next couple of decades. Um, so in this article, this is based on patents, but I think also based on the cost trends work, um, this general message applies. Um, and this author wrote, innovation in solar wind and other renewable power is moving worldwide, especially in China, and is now eclipsing that in fossil fuels, an about phase that occurred in just one generation, new research shows. <coughs> And you know, for those of you that have been working in this area for a long time, you know, I think we're really starting to see the fruits of, of your labor. And you know, I, I see Ralph Sokolo in the front row, and, and you know, others. Um, I think you know, it's it's an exciting time, and there's still you know, there's a ways to go. Um, but this is, I think, a challenge that um, is going to be you know, really, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's a problem that is solvable. Um, and so you know, this idea that transformation is possible through innovation, um, and we're working with, again, you know, firms at different levels and also working with um, trying to get some of this data and these results out to, um, we're working with various um, um, entities that are involved with the climate negotiations and this, you know, some of our work informed this, this report, which was written by former heads of state, you know, in part to prepare for the Paris meetings. Um, okay, so, you know, upshot, I think there's a, there's, I've shown you, I hope I've shown you through this example that there's some power in the predictive evaluation of energy technologies. That, that you know, maybe through data and models we can speed up this technology development process. Um, I'm excited in the next few years, I think there are a number of people working on different aspects of this problem to really bring the field together, bring people together, help, um, you know, this area coalesce. Um, you know, the idea being that, you know, with, with kind of further working, working together further, really building a field where people are sharing ideas, identifying the most challenging research questions, um, you know, sharing contacts, providing employment opportunities for each other's students and so forth. And I think we're at an exciting time in this area, in this field of research. And, um, you know, I, you know, look forward to working with oh. colleagues on this. Thank you. Thanks for that excellent wide ranging talk. Are there questions you have about five minutes? Were costs that you had in the first, we spent most of your time on, were those costs, or net costs, net of subsidies? And uh, were the subsidies different in the different geographic areas? Yeah, so the subsidies would enter into you know, the observation that people are installing solar wind systems in these areas where CHI is less than one, but they're not included in the storage costs. Could you talk a little more about uh, future research and how you think the results you presented today might change when you're modeling the revenue as um, having uh, non endogenous yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I think it wouldn't change much in this scenario of very limited adoption levels, so low penetration rates, I think it wouldn't change. But if we're talking about, um, you know, getting to a system where we have much more solar and wind and, and we have storage technologies, and, you know, you might actually see some of these price spikes, uh, you know, as a number of people have written about, you know, sort of um, becoming less, um, um, you know, less prevalent or less extreme at least. Um, so for, you know, so storage would not add as much value in that context, but the idea is for this type of analysis is, you know, can at very low market share storage begin to enter the market such that its cost can come down 
so that it can later provide the benefit to society of converting low carbon renewable energy to baseload power and energy on demand in general. Yeah. I'm just curious, have you uh, looked at the Tesla batteries and the new announcement recently on yeah. very shortly being available for residential and homes? Oh, right. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, so, I mean, just kind of, so Tesla Model S is up here. Um, great range, but rather expensive if you think of, like, this is the average cost per mile of a vehicle today. Well, but, I meant more for homes. So yeah, yeah, for homes, homes yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so I would say that, um, you know, if we, I think, I think there, and we are looking at this, the challenge is going to be to, to combine technology, hardware and software development. Mm -hmm. So if, if we can start at the home level to look at, um, you know, using your electric vehicle as stationary storage to increase the value of community or household solar, I think that's where they could really gain, um, you know, the, the lithium ion about, you know, car batteries could really start to capture some of that market. But I know you're talking about just installing the residential them maybe, yeah, separately. I'm not sure go. because we've, we've done an analysis in Portugal of, um, of um, uh, the value of adopting solar, uh, sorry, storage with your solar system mm -hmm. at the community level. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not, I, I think, I, I think if one's better off in looking at the, you, elect those batteries for an electric vehicle as well as for the home system. I think they're going to be too expensive. Otherwise, um, but we'll have to see how much they can reduce costs. And I think a lot of that cost reduction is going to come from economies of scale. Improvements, you know, great. I think they've had success with um, Solar City and Walmart using storage with uh, right. uh, commercial. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, and I think, you know, um, it, it still is, it, it is still a bit costly, but, you know, that, you know, they're, it's close, but in my, you know, from what I've seen, it's, it's not quite there yet. Um, but we'll see if the new, you know, the new batteries, look, you know, with this push to create um, large manufacturing facilities, we'll see what the results of that will be. What do you think? Probably a lot of people are still interested. I think we have a few more minutes on your schedule, but I'd like to invite people who need to go at one to turn it out.